Sorry. You, just one second ago, he said, don't forget your microphone, switch it on. <laughs> and here I am. OK, so they haven't missed anything. So it was basically a shopping list of uh, what I wanted to talk about, like uh, problems and things we needed to investigate. And I, I didn't quite know like uh, what common denominator I should give to, or title I should give to this talk. Uh, until Antoine came along and he said, like, oh, why don't you just uh, name it uh, SCI Small in the Rocket Science? So uh, this is a contribution of Antoine to this talk. And not just here, but um, it's, it's the contribution of many, many uh, people that worked uh, with me on this. Uh, Amélie, Jean-François, Oreste, and uh, Mathieu, Damien, uh, and Antoine. And some of these will actually be giving a, a follow-up presentation. Okay, so... Uh, I know we don't need to give a motivation here, but I'm still going to give one. And it's mainly in response to uh, Danny's uh, question ye yesterday. Um, Danny said, uh, how did your thinking change in the last five years? So basically, I added a slide to my talk. Uh, just basically, it can serve as a motivation for why CIS is important. But it's also something that like, uh, really changed in my thinking like, uh, recently. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the metric that we use for scaling, and I think uh, Ken just gave a nice talk about uh, Fractal, and uh, I have certain issues with the way we do things, so I'm going to be presenting them, and maybe I think we should be doing, uh, we should use a, a different way of doing Fractal. Uh, I'm going to be talking about localization in space and time, uh, what do we mean, well, uh, we've seen LKFs in the CI spec, so they are localized in space, this is clear, they are localized in time because they come and they go and they come and they go. Okay, so are our models uh, able to reproduce this? And I'm going to be talking about uh, angle of fractures, uh, non-normal flow rule versus uh, normal flow rule. Daniel will give an entire talk on this, but uh, basically I'll just be talking about uh, uh, how well does theory match with our observation for different uh, models that we use in the community. Okay, uh, so basically like you have a large scale atmospheric forcing and then so there's like vorticity input into the ocean and those are a large scale feature. But what the sea ice does is that it takes this large scale feature, which is synoptic, like four or 500 kilometer, uh, three to five days, like a time scale. And what it does, it actually like uh, confines them along very specific line of like a high uh, vorticity uh, over very narrow uh, line. Uh, and basically uh, it can go from nothing at all to all of a sudden you have a fracture and then you basically have like a, a large uh, vorticity input into your ocean. So it really changes the nature of the vorticity input uh, into your ocean. Uh, and this is a representation of uh, nature. Uh, and this is like a, a model. Uh, Neil Zutter published this. And this is another model uh, from Pierre Ampal of how they reproduce this, uh, this, this feature. Uh, so the motivation, the link with the nonlinear uh, Ekman dynamics. Uh, when I read like McPhee et al. paper in 2005, I don't know if you guys have read this paper, but basically during the Sheba camp, like in March, there was a fracture that went all alongside the ship. And there, bas there was basically like a, a fracture event. There was a ridge building. And just beside, we had a tent and we, we were measuring like an ocean turbulent heat flux. And basically what we saw like was a rise in the, in the, in the isopycnol, a rise in the iso A line, a rise in the uh, temperature line as well. Uh, and basically, uh, the turbulence mass like that uh, Miles had deployed there uh, measured like a fluxes uh, up to 400 watt per meter square. And the story in the 2005 paper, fracture, uh, positive ice ocean surface stress curl, uh, Ekman divergence, Ekman pumping upward, large turbulent heat flux. Okay, well, uh, so this was really simple and I understood this perfectly. So. We run an LES type like simulation, one meter resolution. And what we do is that uh, basically like a, a linear Ekman dynamics does not work in this situation because uh, the, the forcing is over very uh, narrow uh, spatial scale. So the Rossby number is uh, very high. So you can't in, ignore the advection term. Uh, and basically when you have an upwelling case, like what Miles was saying we saw here, uh, what you have is a, a very broad, slow upwelling, okay? And when you have a downwelling event, you have a very fast, narrow jet. And so basically, like counterintuitively, uh, basically when you actually, actually have downwelling, you have a narrow jet very fast, and this is when you have large upward vertical uh, turbulent heat flux. Uh, and when you have upwelling, there's no turbulent heat flux whatsoever. Even the mean doesn't do very much. 
So basically it means that like uh, you have a heart attack high, so you have a lot of those uh, negative ice ocean surface stress curl that would be uh, causing downwelling. And they can cause like turbulent heat flux from uh, remnant heat, remnant solar heat, like beneath the mixed layer uh, up to the surface. So how did my thinking change? Uh, well, it changed because I thought I understood everything and now like this is completely going against like what Miles was saying. Uh, they observed like a uh, upwelling and large turbulent heat flux and we're seeing like from models that uh, we should not be seeing large turbulent heat flux. Uh, was it something that came naturally at the Shiba camp that co was coincident with this event? Was it the geostrophic flow going under the ridge being perturbed? that we saw there, uh, basically then now uh, it's an open question. So, so I went from thinking I understood to now like not really understanding uh, what happened there. And below here while downwelling, you see a lot of turbulence uh, and then uh, basically uh, uh, you see like a buoyant flux only, that's when you reject salt. So it does a bit of work for you as well. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna start with the metrics question. Uh, so this is an image of uh, LKFs from uh, RGPS, okay? Uh, so what we do is that we measure the total deformation, and the total deformation is made up of two terms. Uh, it's the divergence, and it's the shear. So you square them, and you take the square root. So this is the metric, the metric that is typically used in our field to uh, characterize uh, like deformation. And then we bin it here, as if we do a PDF in bins, and we have the RGPS here in black, and we have maybe a model, let's say in black as well. And what Cyrex recommend is bin by bin to see what is a departure between the model and the observation. You integrate that, and this is a measure of how close you are uh, to reality. Uh, then the, the question that you ask is, are they localized in time? Uh, so what do you do then? Well, you go from one little square and you calculate all of your deformation and your total deformation then you double your square and you double your square and each time you mean those quantity and you recalculate this uh, and basically as a function of spatial scale or temporal scale you can do that in time as well uh, you see that the total divergence total like deformation decreases and when you do averaging you basically have like a, a smaller number and if there's a slope then you say it's a sign of localization uh, in uh, in space okay if there were no localization in space uh, basically, you will not see uh, higher deformation at finer scale and lower, uh, and lower deformation at larger, uh, in, like uh, average uh, scale. I will not talk about multifractality here like too much, so I will leave this uh, on, on the side. Uh, so one issue that I had here, and it was related, that's why I asked the question to Ken, is that uh, divergence is linear and uh, shear is nonlinear. So I could imagine a flow field where all you had is divergence and no shear. And basically my total deformation would be linear. And basically there would be no scaling because everything is linear. And this averaging would just basically uh, result in the same exact number. So basically it looks like divergence, the way we do it, does not contribute at all to localization. And even shear sometimes can not contribute to localization. I'll give an example uh, just before. And I think like what Ken was saying is that they are, they are using threshold and one and zeros. And if you do this, this is the way physicists do it. And I guess mathematicians as well. If you do it like this, then even the linear term will give you some localization. But the way we do it, it does not. And, and this is an example of a, like a large breakup event north of Alaska. And I'm simplifying things a bit, but I see here a dominance of DUDX divergence, like you have a fault here in tension and that are uh, triggered by a slip here, so large DUDY. So basically DUDX, DUDY dominating my field, which means that my shear now and my uh, divergence both are linear. So I would argue that a field like this would not give you localization uh, in space because both terms are linear and the way we do things, it would result in, the, in no slope. So I'm questioning like a, a bit like the way we're doing things. And I'll be happy like, uh, to hear what Ken or uh, any other people like, think about, uh, about this, but we're thinking of now doing it more like with threshold, the way physicists and mathematicians do. Okay, so uh, localization in space and time. So the key ingredients. So there was a very nice article by Weiss and Dan Ho here that was published recently. 
it really forced like a lot of thinking in the in our community about what are the ingredients that triggers localization in space and localization in time and what they argue in this paper is that a threshold mechanics leading to fracture and damage when ci strength is exceeded so a yield curve when you read the, the, the yield curve you have fracture uh, and you have some form of damage okay and of course after you deform and if you deform and you have divergence the concentration goes down the thickness goes down and these are all amplifying factors here okay that could cause like a a stress decrease uh, you need long range elastic interaction that carries local fracture to larger scale okay that's the elastic term uh, a viscous stress relaxation after the fracture and a healing mechanism that is slow compared with the elastic stress redistribution uh, that's responsible for the intermittency you fail you deform but you heal and then later there'll be a memory through the thickness and concentration field you will be more likely to fail there if the wind picks up again okay oh. uh, that's what i said here okay so it was a very nice paper by uh, uh, Amélie Bouchard uh, in 2002, the SIRX-1, and Niels Witter will be presenting SIRX-2 like, uh, later in the afternoon, like he's in uh, Washington, I believe. Uh, but basically, 35 different runs, I believe, all rheologies, like um, MEB, EVP, VP, EAP, like you name it, they were all there. And basically, uh, they did an exercise where they ran for two years and calculated the deformation. And the message we get from this is that Every single model, irrespective of their physics, have a scale, like localization in space. Okay? So they have a scaling. So the slope changes sometimes, but if we look at those models which have like the correct resolution, uh, we are comparing against our GPS data, 10 kilometer, three days average. Okay, so basically a finite difference model needs six, seven grid point to resolve a discontinuity. So you need a model of one, two kilometer resolution if you take those at high resolution model, there's uh, four or five of them, four, and you look at the arrows there, and basically they have also the same slope as the RGPS, which is shown in black here. So the green here is next sim. Uh, you see here the red is uh, the ups or FISM. I can't read the color. Those two basically, you can't even see them. They're beneath like the black line. Okay, so basically. Uh, those four models, MIT GCM at two kilometers, FISM, REOPS, uh, and NEXIM, all land onto the correct uh, slope according to our GPS. Okay, so basically, is this putting in question the criteria that I just presented in the previous slide, or is it the fact that we're still limited? We're at three days temporal frequencies. Okay, so this is always like a, a, um, a limitation we need to keep in mind. Once we have one day and 12 hours, are these uh, models still be able to reproduce like with the observation show but so far at the resolution we have with the data we have basically uh, all model have spatial localization and temporal localization is so ubiqu ubiquitous that it really makes you wonder like uh, whether it doesn't just come from the atmosphere we're down now to saying we're going to run our model in free drift and we're going to do this analysis and see if we have a slope do we have like a intermittency in just in the forcing and basically that's where it comes from that's where we're down to because we see it so widely so profoundly so everywhere okay uh, so basically one common thing that you need like that all those models have and that i believe but even that like we haven't shown it but one thing that's common is that you, there's a threshold and you go from small deformation to large deformation uh, rapidly and there's a threshold and this threshold can be anything because any model actually uh, reproduces it. So in the MEB, the small deformation are elastic, just like the real world. Uh, the plastic deformation are simulated as viscous, and you go from small to large. In the E or VP, uh, those are highly viscous, the elastic deformation. The plastic deformation are plastic, and uh, basically uh, the strain weakening, but sometimes it's also hardening, and like once you have a deformation, it's done uh, in the EMEB with a damage. So it's an initial damage that causes the fracture to propagate. And later on, it feeds into the thickness and the concentration field because you can have divergence. And in the uh, VP, it's done only through thickness and concentration. Uh, but uh, we can also put damage in a VP model. And uh, this is like my little reminder in purple here on the top left. This is Antoine who's gonna give a presentation on 
uh, titled, I believe, um, damaging the, the viscous plastic model. So how do you include a damage parameter, a parameterization? But the bottom line is that uh, we know damage exists and we know damage dice is weaker. Uh, it's a very powerful scaling parameter. It's very sensitive. It's like, uh, it's like the sea ice albedo for an Arctic uh, clim climate uh, scientist. Right? It's like you change that, the way you do damage and you can have any slope uh, you want. It's a very, very like a powerful uh, diagnostic. And, but it's not one that's based on physics. It's one that we, we know exists and we've put a formulation to actually include it. Okay? So uh, we're coming back to this. So threshold, yes, like a yield curve, yes. Uh, damage, no, it's not necessary, at least at the scale of the RGPS, three days, 10 kilometers. Uh, long range elastic interaction, no, you don't need that. But a viscous plastic model, like the viscous part, the deformation are so small, it's eight orders of magnitude smaller than your typical RGPS deformation. Okay, so basically it's an ideal plastic material. There is no elastic part in that model. And when you solve for the plastic, uh, for the deformation, you have an iterative solver and an, an implicit solver. Basically, in that solver, uh, you are resolving those long range uh, like communication because you're iterating to convergence. It fails here, and you iterate until you see a nice long line. These things just occur instantaneously in a, in a VP model, basically. Okay? But the bottom line is that uh, we, you don't need elastic uh, deformation with the scale that we have in RGPS. Viscous stress relaxation, there's no, there's no such thing in VP model, uh, and they show like the same uh, scaling laws. Uh, a healing mechanism, there is in the VP, there is in the Nexim, there is in all model. So does it mean that it's necessary? I'm starting to think that we need to test that as well. Uh, and I'm, I said, we're gonna run the model in free drift and see if we see some uh, localization in time, basically. Okay. okay, so there's also a, uh, a dependence uh, of, um, of those scaling law uh, on, the, on poorly, on poorly like, constrained, like a mechanical strength parameter, compressive and shear strength. We're used to seeing the ellipse, the ellipse aspect ratio of two, uh, but some people have made it like a little fatter, less fat. And basically, like, uh, we don't have really data like, to constrain those things. And when you do change those things, your scaling law uh, uh, changes quite uh, drastically. And we're showing this here only at 10 kilometer. Uh, at two kilometer, there would be a much more, like, a, it would be more, much more dense in LKF. But at two, uh, at two, 10 kilometer, it's less dense, but, but you see the pattern here. Uh, when you decrease the compressive strength, okay, you have more of those LKF compared to uh, when you have a large compressive strength. And this is simple to understand, it's weaker. If it's weaker, it's easier to deform and you see those lines. Same thing when you decrease your thickness. Niels Hutter in his paper 2018 showed that when ice is thinner, the scaling is more steep, more localization of fracture. Uh, the shear is exactly the opposite. When you increase shear, you get more localized deformation. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because uh, basically, um, it takes forever to load the ice to the point where it will fail, but once it fails, huge release of this, like all this stored energy, and you're gonna have very active uh, shear lines. So the way to get, uh, the way to get like a localization in space is to increase shear or to decrease compressive strength. And then you can look at your thickness field and which one gives you the best uh, match with the uh, observational data. And you can decide, Amelia decided that uh, we needed to increase shear, not uh, decrease uh, compressive strength at 10 kilometer to match the observation in terms of thickness. Okay, so another point that I want to, uh, that I feel like we still don't quite understand. Uh, this is a picture by uh, Neil Hutters, 2018, and this is basically Neil's like uh, developing an algorithm and tracking all of these points and linking them together. Even when there is gap in between, he has a strategy to actually uh, decide whether they, they're part of the same feature or not. And then he looks at all the intersecting uh, segment and he looks at the angle in between and he plots uh, here like the RGPS in orange. And what we see is we see a peak at an angle between 40 and 60. Okay, so we're gonna see around, I don't know, 45 or, or 50. And when we look at models, well, all models, no models have like uh, this peak basically. Uh, whether it's uh, EAP, uh, MEB, VP, the MEB does have a peak at higher angle, 
but no one has this peak in the correct location. And the question is like, what is it we don't understand to actually predict the fracture angle uh, for a given rheology? And Damien will give an entire talk later on the, how do we predict a fracture angle? We're very good with a normal flow rule model, but with non-normal flow rule model, we have problem we don't understand. He's gonna be talking to you about this. Uh, so what people do is that they, uh, they say there's a peak around here, okay? I'm gonna take like a more coolant theory, and this is the angle of the internal angle of friction, and this is the pile of sand, the same thing as my pile of ice. You know, when I load the ice here, I get like a pyramid, just like I get a pyramid of sand. The slope of this pyramid is the internal angle of friction. Yeah, if it's a large angle of friction, I can have a pyramid like this if my sand is wet on the beach. And when my sand is dry, my, my, my sand castle is much more, much less steep. So basically you can actually, uh, from observation, 45, 50 is the peak. So you can define your angle of uh, your internal angle of friction from observation. You stick that into your model. You would expect that you would get the right angle, but you don't because basically for, for non-normal flow rule, we, we more Coulomb, uh, this more Coulomb criteria derived from just a static angle of friction does not apply. And this is an example that uh, Mathieu here has, uh, has uh, uh, simulated in his last uh, paper. So basically you have a column of ice, you load it axially, it's an MEB model. Uh, and uh, here you have the more Coulomb theory. And here you have uh, different runs with different parameter. I won't go into, but basically it does not match theory. Okay, it's higher the angle. And this explains the reason why the peak in the MEB is sitting more to the right than where it is observed, even though we use more Coulomb theory to set that internal angle of friction parameter. So it's just more Coulomb does not just, just does not apply for, um, for granular material, pressure sensitive material, non-normal flow, flow rule material. So then what governs the fracture angle for a material, okay, like a real CIs that does not follow a normal flow rule? Dami will be talking about that. And he's showing some results that are a little disconcerting because it really means like something very fundamental we're not understanding here. Uh, and I will let you let him talk to you about this. Okay, so the outstanding question. So what sets localization in space? Uh, is it the threshold only? Uh, once we have like higher resolution in, in, in time and space uh, data, uh, maybe uh, damage and everything will become like necessary, uh, necessary ingredient. But as of now, it's not. What sets localization in time? Uh, is it coming from the atmosphere? Is it healing only? We still need to do a few more runs and really like go to the very, very simpler like uh, configuration to test like all possibilities. Again, I'm reminding you of this, like Amelie, every time I talk to her, she keeps reminding me of this. Bruno, like, be careful. Uh, it's the observation of limited temporal and spatial resolution. The buoy have very good temporal resolution, hourly, but poor spatial resolution. Uh, radar set has good spatial resolution, but poor temporal because we only have three days. So these limitations needs to be kept in mind. What sets the internal angle of fracture? No idea yet, I hope. Uh, stress, strain, a mix of both. So basically, uh, these are the outstanding questions that I see uh, in, the, in the, the field of like CIS uh, dynamics. This is it. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. Are there questions? Yes. Let me just wait a tiny bit. Is there anybody else who wants a question first? Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Bruno. Um, so I want to relate to uh, your, the questions you ask now. Um, do you think the... Do you it's hear me well? Louder. Yeah, a bit louder. Okay. Do you think the Arctic Ocean with uh, the observations that we have now is a good laboratory to answer these questions or like, could we go as well as small scale as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Okay, you're asking me because you're on the microphone for other people, but uh, I, I'm not hearing you. So, oh, uh, so you're saying like, a observation technologies we have now is a good laboratory for answering these questions, like in terms of, uh, well, we need a large spatial scale. Uh, we couldn't go in the fjord in, uh, in Maine and do this or on the St. Lawrence. Uh, we need a spatial scale. 
and we need a temporal scale. So I would say, yes, we need to go there. I mean, uh, RCM, I like the radar set uh, constellation mission that Canada has just launched. And then like, there's also the Sentinel. There's a possibility there to go like from three days to one day. That would be like a step in the right direction. Uh, and uh, I believe, I mean, radar set can go down to 20 kilometer, but people tend to say, no, we're going to give you a product at 10 kilometer. I'm not an expert in that. I, I, I'm always wondering, can't you give it to us like at, at uh, five or four or three kilometers? Uh, maybe someone in this community could answer this question better. Uh, but basically, there's hope that we can go and increase the temporal resolution and then the spatial resolution uh, also. Uh, and, uh, but I do think, yes, uh, we have no choice. We, we, we have to rely on large scale bodies of ice. Oh, 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 you're being snubbed completely. <laughs> well, you said you want um, the large scale bodies of ice, but with the uh, sea ice, and it seems this, this the case has some self similarity across the scales. Like if you do a lab test, you still see the same kind of patterns that you see in real life. Do you think there's no way to use those more with more like engineering type hmm. models or okay well uh, yeah you got me there like it's true if it's a sim similarity of scale what i would say well because uh, when they go in the lab and they put like a glycol into their eyes so it makes it weaker because you want to respect some scaling laws like um so i, I don't know like how, how how accurate like all the all the non-dimensional parameters are respected when into, when you go into the lab uh, I've never done lab work, but my discussion with a few people said that you can match a few non-dimensional parameter, but not all of them. So I would see that as maybe an issue, but uh, it sounds like a good idea. And like, uh, yeah, like uh, there's, well, there's ice tank in Newfoundland, Canada, like, uh, and I, yeah, maybe like uh, we'll think about that more and I'll, I'll get back to you. Thanks for sharing. Hi Bruno. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks for the uh, very interesting talk. Um, so a lot of these questions about uh, localization in space and time were plaguing me and some of my colleagues when we were building the classic anisotropic plastic model. Okay. So you mentioned some of the properties for directly simulating localization in Vice and Danserel. Okay. So what I would say is there may be some mileage in looking at discrete element modeling. Okay. Yes. So there's a paper by myself, Alexander Wolczynski, and Mark Hopkins back in 2010, and we examined many of the same questions, okay, and we came to similar conclusions about needing elastic behavior, okay, some critical response and some healing to generate that localization of space and time. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, get, we did generate that localization of space and time, and we got uh, angles of fractures which had a peak, okay, which were about... Um, we're about 30 to 40 degrees, not the 40 to 50 degrees yeah. that you found in the observations. Mm -hmm. But that's just a matter of what parameter you put into the model. Okay? So I think there's some scope in doing, in looking at those sorts of methodologies. Yes. The other thing I was going to say is I like your idea of saying this scaling behavior happens whatever you do to the model, okay, and whatever sort of model you use. Yeah. Um, an outcome of the um, some work that was simulated in the program back in 2017 was to look at idealized geometries and forcings and apply that to different rheologies. We, we looked, and Harry Horton did this, okay, and others, okay, including me, okay, and he did show this scaling behavior resulted from um, very idealized forcings and idealized geometries. Okay. So it seems to be an intrinsic property of these sorts of models and not a function of the, the, like, the spatial heterogeneity of the forcing or the boundaries. And when you run your DEM, like uh, sometimes DEM will have like rods connecting them, and then when they fail, the rod disappears, and now you're left with friction and contact normal. Did you have like those rods connecting, like uh, so that like it would be a form of damage uh, if you break those rods? Did you have that like in your paper with Johnson? And, uh... Uh, the, the paper back with uh, Mark Hopkins and Alexander Wachinski. 
So the, the unique thing we did in that thing, with that paper was to incorporate shear rupture as a, as a failure mechanism, yeah. okay? But once it ruptured, it ruptured, okay? Um, so the damage was an emergent property, if you like, you can see all the cracks had formed, yes. okay? It wasn't an additional phase parameter brought into the model. I'll read that paper. Thanks for pointing it to okay. me. Yeah. One more question. This is not so much a question for Bruno, but just a, a comment that it, it seems like this issue with the remote sensing observations being limited in time and the buoys being limited in space is perhaps low hanging fruit for somebody applying machine learning or some other techniques to try to fill in that data. Uh, you think with all of the buoy data or uh, that we have like in uh, or you're thinking use more whatever from... you've got. <laughs> yeah. So you just throw it throw everything at it but can can ai invent stuff that doesn't exist in the data <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, good. okay great yeah thank Thanks. you bruno um, the next talk will also be about small scale ci dynamics um matthew Have you actually answered the question that you raised in your title? Oh, sorry? Have you answered the question that no, you no, raised just in raised, your title? No, no, I just raised question. <laughs> I did not, no, 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 I was not here. Like Danny uh, tasked us no, to... No, about uh, the rocket science. Yeah, is it rocket uh, Yeah, it seems like, uh, <laughs> since we don't understand those simple things, it looks like uh, it's a bit of a yes. <laughs> if I understand the expression correctly. Uh, so we can I can go out there. You can. Okay. <laughs> oh, and also the. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> For us,